Father, we, we certainly are eager to see your return and to see what we'll look like when we look like you. Those who love you, those who love your gospel, those who love your truth, pursue sanctification, pursue holiness, because we long to be like you when, when you come. And we know, Lord, that that hope, that anticipation is not a vain hope. It's not, it's not a hope that um, we hope of some fiction that we wish it could be true. It's, it's fact, and that we trust the gospel, and we know that all of our pursuits for holiness will be guaranteed. We will be like you when you return, and we'll be found in you. And so we long for that day. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of corporate church that we get to gather as your people. Thank you for the grace that it is to hear one another sing, to, to open up our scriptures, to look at truth, and to think about the obligation on our conscience and on our heart and in our life, and to get to pursue obedience to that together as a church body, to be a means of grace in the lives of one another as we stir one another up and as we push, pull, and prod one another toward obedience. And so, Lord, this morning's no different. We know that really there, there is a, a corporate element where we, we, uh, we sing and, and speak and study and open up our Bibles and pray, and, and we do all of this together as a, as, a, as a church. And there are so many brothers and sisters here in this room, and that's part of the grace. And we also know at the very same time that you are the only audience we long for you to be pleased. We long for you to be glorified. We long for you to be honored. Now, as we turn our attention to your word, give us grace to hear and to hear well. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may take a seat, and I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. As you're, as you're turning there, uh, you know... I was so... I was, uh, I was really just loving that song, that, that last song there that we just sang, and... And um, I was a little bit, uh, I actually uh, deceived myself there for a moment because uh, I probably don't, I, you know, I, I, I think, I, I like to think of myself as a really good singer and um, no one else has shared that opinion that I know of, but I have a high view of that of myself and, uh, and there, was a, there was a note there where I hit the, I started singing right when Sam did and it felt awesome <laughs> because I, I heard Sam's voice right when I started singing, and I'm like, man, that, that's probably what it's going to be like to be glorified, so I'm looking forward to that day. Um, he's going to make us perfect, so thank you. In ser all seriousness, though, I do want to thank all the musicians, all of you who, who lead, and all of you who serve, instrumentalists and vocalists alike, thank you so much for serving us every Lord's Day. There's just such an incredibly skilled group of individuals who serve us, and I, on behalf of everybody, just, I want to keep that in front of us. We are grateful. So thank you to all who serve in the music ministry. Well, this morning I want to direct your attention to the next parable in Mark chapter 4. We're in this section of the parables of the kingdom. And this next one is, as the NAS has it, the parable of the seed. The parable of the seed. And I think it... Uh, it might, at first glance, look like a better title to say... The parable of the sleeping farmer. Let's read verses 26 to 29. Jesus says, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The kingdom of God does not need our help. Granted, what we experience here on earth is not the kingdom. The kingdom of God's in breaking, where he comes to rule and to reign, mediated in human form, namely through his son, Jesus Christ, the son of David, that is still future. Uh, the kingdom will not be seen in a 
tangible, literal way, the way that it was prophesied in the Old Testament, until Christ comes back a second time. Christ's first coming foreshadowed this. We see his rule and reign in a localized fashion. We see his righteousness on display. We see him, his power over Satan, his power over demons, his healing, his resurrection of, the, of others from the dead, his resurrection of himself from the dead. And wherever he personally abides, it virtually eradicates sickness and disease and demonic uh, dominion. It was a foretaste of what's going to happen at a global level when he returns. Think about it this way. God is so relentlessly committed to his own glory that he's going to come back and rule and reign. He's going to establish his kingdom, and he's going to do it in such a way that there will be no question who brought the kingdom. He did, and he will. And we'll look back at that from the position of being in the kingdom and know this is a divine rule, and no human being could have brought this about. However, in this church age, he's committed to wait until the word has done its work. Until... The citizens of this future kingdom have become heirs to this incredible estate. Right now, God is accomplishing this work through his word, which is powerful in and of itself. The word of God is not merely a means of helping man actuate his inner potential, uh, let alone helping us usher in his kingdom It's not like a toy powered by a battery, as if we're the ones who effectuate something or bring it about. How God's going to establish his kingdom is incredibly divine. The parable that we are looking at this morning is, as I mentioned, it's called the parable of the seed. Maybe it's even called the parable of the sleeping farmer. Perhaps better, even? The parable of the self-building seed, the self-growing seed. He describes a seed that does the work automatically in and of itself. And before we dive into the details of this parable, I want to show you a a parallel. That's a tongue twister there. A parallel of the parable in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And you remember what Paul said about working in the kingdom, working in the church. When it comes to doing kingdom work, uh, certainly God does use men. There are means, and in fact we see that in our parable, we'll, we'll see the means of a, of a farmer who actually casts seed. But here's the theological explanation of the parable that we are studying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, look, follow along. Paul writes, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. And in that phrase, in that one simple sentence, Paul uses two different verb tenses to show that there was an action committed by Paul, there was an action committed by Paulos, and behind and underneath all of that continually was this causative power of growth. Paul is actually planting, Apollos is actually watering, but that watering and that planting mean nothing apart from God supernaturally underneath it all, accomplishing growth. Verse 7 then comes to a logical conclusion, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. He doesn't even say anyone, anything. Reflecting the question that he asks back in verse 5, what is Apollos, what is Paul, not who is Apollos, who is Paul, what are they, what are we? We are nothings. Not no ones, we're nothing. So verse 7, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth, i.e., is everything. God's everything. I mean, to think think that he would use human means is, is unbelievable condescension. To think that he would use imperfect vessels to do something that he's going to accomplish with perfection, that actually takes more work. He could have done it on his own without the inconvenience. And so, in this parable, Jesus is going to give us some incredible truths about the nature of the kingdom. And he's telling this 
parable, and it's certainly something that's explained publicly. We saw that several weeks ago, back in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He began to teach by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat um, in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and, and he was speaking to them in his doctrine. And then it goes on with the first parable being the parable of the soils. And we looked at that, and um, the explanation of the soils comes in verses 13 to 20. And then last time, we, we spent a couple weeks, actually, looking at what it means for the lamp to be brought for the sake of revelation, and then also for the, the nature of reception, that you, you can never flatline, and how you listen. And so that's in verses 20 to 25. And now Mark continues to just des- describe uh, another parable. And this is so rich, this section we're in in Mark chapter 4, because similar to last time, verses 21 to 25, that little speech, that little section of this speech is not recorded anywhere else. As we mentioned a couple weeks ago, you can find parallels of almost each and every one of those statements throughout his earthly ministry in various assorted contexts and sermons, and most of them with even different contexts that have a different nuance as he uses the same word picture or the same phrase. Now we get to verse 26 to 29. Not only is there no parallel to this uh, by way of fragmentation or any little soundbite, there's just no parallel to this at all anywhere else in Scripture. Mark's the only one who records it. And so if you add this to Matthew 13, you're up to eight parables on the kingdom. And so this parable is about... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through this parable by, by giving you a how-to instruction list. And, and, and I, I, I debated doing this because you know how-to can, can often be bad. And in this case, it's really bad. This is actually not a how-to. I'm going to give you a how-to just so you can see the, the point of this parable and to accentuate it. So as I give you this how-to, realize it's not the how-to. How to build a self-building kingdom. How do you build a kingdom that builds itself? The kingdom is self Producing The word is powerful in and of itself. It's self-actuating because it's divine power, God working through his word. So when you're dealing with that kind of reality, how do you, how do you grow a self-producing plant? How do you build a self-building kingdom? And so that's kind of what happens in this parable. And, you know, honestly, this parable is so powerful because it just refreshes us in the incredible sufficiency and power of God's word. And before we dive into the parable, I'm going to do one more thing. I just want to ask you to consider some of the symptoms that go along with doubting God's powerful word. If we don't benefit from this parable, this is going to have a lot of detrimental effects in our lives, in our evangelism, in our parenting, in our ministry, in how we approach the world, Think about what happens. We might even believe the content and know, man, the content in this book is true. I believe what it says, but at the same time as believing the content, start to doubt its power, and that's going to have very devastating effects in our lives, in our ministry, in our relationships. First of all, it produces pragmatism. What do you mean? What does that mean? Pragmatism. Pragmatism just means you judge the ends the, 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 the ends by, by the means by the ends. So in other words, whatever you do to get there, whatever you need to produce the results, it's worth it. And so what happens in, in the Christian life, sometimes we might believe the truth revealed in God's word, but start to doubt the power of the word and think that we have to make it happen. If that happens in evangelism, that leads to another dangerous result of doubting God's word, manipulation. We might even try to manipulate. We might even try to share the gospel in such a way that we can get results. I mean, I remember, I remember one of the first times I ever spoke publicly. Um, when I was saved at the age of 19, um, I didn't fear a lot, but my greatest fear was probably public speaking. And um, I remember I was playing, uh, I played uh, volleyball for the, for the school where I was at, and the volleyball team, uh, it was a Bible college in Chicago, at Moody Bible Institute. And we had an outreach down at a a juvenile delinquent. Uh, Basically, it was the maximum security juvenile delinquent center. So these guys are, are, most of these guys are headed off to the penitentiary once they turn 17. And we went down there and had a, had an evangelistic um, outreach. We would, you know, teach them volleyball and then open up the scriptures and and teach God's word. 
And I remember uh, they asked me to, 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 to preach the gospel one particular outreach. And I was a, I was a young believer. I'd probably been in the, the Lord maybe a year, less than a, probably a year, maybe, maybe two years. Um, and I remember op- opening up the gospel and walking through some very basic, simple truths of the gospel. And then I told this gut-wrenching story about the mud flats in Alaska, where, and, and Smed's been there, and Smed's seen them, where the tidal, the tide of the ocean covers so much ground because it's so flat for so long and so far that the tide coming in makes dangerous, dangerous progress toward the shore and then back out to the ocean as the tide comes in and out. And people get trapped out there and stuck out there. And so I told some story that I found on probably some newspaper clipping about somebody who got stuck in the mud and they couldn't rescue and then they ended up drowning. And I drug out the story and by the end of this thing, every kid in that in that Bible study is just like, you know, almost tearing up. And then I'm like, you need to be saved. Give your life to Christ. And everybody raises their hand. We all prayed a prayer and we went home. We got out of our vans at the school and I'm walking into my dorm and the other volleyball players are like, man, John, 30 out of 30 conversions, that's something. (laughs) Now, could some of them have been saved? Uh, They could have been. I talked about sin. I talked about the cross and I talked about Christ and but there was an emotional, there was an emotional manipulation to that response. And it was effective for getting teenagers who were spared, scared spitless about the next year of their life to raise their hand. Doesn't mean, because I manipulated them emotionally, doesn't mean that God did a work. How about this? If we start doubting the power of God's word, we're going to start experiencing fear and anxiety in our evangelism. Suddenly, the success of our evangelism is going to ride on our ability to share the gospel. It rides on our ability, our eloquence, our articulation. Did we ask the right questions? Did we bring the right punch at the same time to you know, maximize the effect? It starts to become a performance. Very similarly, if we doubt the power of God's word, it's going to start to produce fear and anxiety in our parenting. Well, yeah, I, I trust the word, but I mean, I, is, it, is it having its effect? I mean, are, are my kids saved? Are they going to get saved? Are they going to get turned? Are they going to do, I mean, what am I doing wrong? I want, to see them, I want to see them repent. I want to see them convert. On the flip side of both of those, we could also say it's, if we doubt the power of God's word, we, we are going to be experiencing pride in evangelism and pride in our parenting. Because whatever looks like success, we'll actually take credit for ourselves instead of trusting the power of God. Another implication of, or, or a result of doubting God's word as far as its power would be worldly mindedness. For the simple reason that we start losing confidence in the power of a, the word, we, we start losing confidence in its promise and in its future uh, element and the eternal realities. We start living for this life All of this flows out of doubting the power of God's word. And so we need this parable. We need this parable. We need to understand it. We need to consider it. And so let's dive right in. In verse 26, we see our first step in how to build the self-building kingdom. And remember, it's not a a step-by-step. It's not a how-to. Okay, So I'm rebuking you for listening to my my outline. (laughs) How do you like that? (laughs) How to build the self-building kingdom. Number one, so. I'll, I'll just give them to you up front. Number one, verse 26, so. Number two, verses 27 and 28, sleep. And then number three, verse 29, stand by. So there's your outline. That's how you build a self-building kingdom. You sow, you sleep, and you stand by. Let's look at them one at a time. Verse 26, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. Now, this is important because Jesus' very first line as he introduces this parable is, the kingdom of God is like. This reminds us Uh, what has already been explained to us in the Gospel of Mark, but it wouldn't have been explained to the public multitude that would have been hearing this on the seashore. What the disciples and the insiders, those who had ears to hear, who went and pressed Jesus for greater understanding about the identity of what's happening in these parables, they would have heard this. Go back to verse 11. 
He was saying to those, this is the disciples and the, his followers, the 12 and everybody else who was following after him. As soon as he was alone, he said to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. And so remember, this is a, a parable is intended to reveal to one group of people, and it's intended to conceal to another group of people. So what Jesus is doing here is he's giving truth, and namely, in verse 11, this is the mystery of the kingdom of God. The mystery of the kingdom of God. So go back to verse 26. He goes, and goes ahead and makes a, a metaphor, a simile here, of uh, what the kingdom of God is like. And we need to remember that we're talking about the mystery of the kingdom of God. So I don't expect you to remember this. This was weeks ago, if not over a month ago. It probably was over a month ago. But remember from verse 11, the word mystery, it's, it's, it's actually a, a transliteration of the original Greek word, mysterion. But the Greek word that's translated mystery is, is a little bit different than the first common connotation that probably comes to your mind when you hear the English word mystery. You might think of a, you know, some sort of murder mystery. It's a crime or problem that needs to be solved, some sort of riddle that needs a completion or a conclusion. Or, Well, the, the original word mystery in the Greek language is more along the ideas of a secret. It's a secret. It's a transcendent idea. It's something that would never be known unless it were revealed. So a previously reveal, unrevealed reality, a previously unrevealed truth. So it's a secret that we, we would only know if God said, you know what, I'm going to let them in on my secret. And so God reveals, here's what's going on in, with the kingdom. So it's interesting. When Jesus is saying, here's something that the kingdom of God is like, he uses a phrase that we all know and we've all heard, and it's all over the Old Testament. The, king, the Old Testament is, is ripe and loaded with prophecies about what the kingdom of God is and what it will look like when God brings it to earth, which is namely divine dominion mediated through human rule and a perfect human being, a son of David, who's going to reverse the curse and establish righteousness in Zion and rule globally. None of that that I just told you, none of, nothing in that description of the kingdom is a mystery when Jesus speaks this parable. You realize that? In other words, it's not a mystery because it's already been revealed. Okay, so, so the mystery of the kingdom is something new that hasn't been revealed yet until Jesus is starting to give these parables. So to appreciate the, the newness of this Mystery. Let's go back and look at what's not mystery. Let's look at the old information about the, about the kingdom. Because the old information about the kingdom is still just as valid. It's just that he's going to give us more information about the kingdom. So let's go back to the book Zephaniah. Let's look at Zephaniah for a second. And we're looking at old information about the kingdom. This is the information that would not have been a mystery from the vantage point of Jesus preaching these parables. This is public. This is already revealed. This is already prophesied. Now, Zephaniah is an example I wanted to pick. I picked this simply because it describes the kingdom without even using the phrase kingdom of God. And, I, and that's a good example because there's a lot here. I mean, I could have picked a dozen passages, but I wanted to give you one, at least one example where the reality of the kingdom is, is being described, even though the term is not used. And so uh, you'll, you'll keep hearing the word day in that day, and that's a very uh, common referent to the coming of the kingdom. Um, it's, the, it's a future day. It's an eschatological day. It's a day yet in the future from Zephaniah's standpoint and still as I'm standing before you today, 2022, it is still yet future. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. I mean, this is talking about a future day when God is going to reign, and his reign is actually a, do a dominion that's going to be over all of the world's superpowers, every human kingdom, every human nation, and they're all going to be brought together to give an account. This is global dominion. Then, verse 9, for then I will give to the peoples purified lips, 
that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Now he starts to describe this kingdom is not just going to be the bringing of justice and judgment for their lives. It's actually going to be a purifying element where he is cultivating for himself a people with purified lips who will actually serve him. They'll call on him. They're going to worship him. And then he says shoulder to shoulder, and it's clearly a global shoulder to shoulder. This is across the entire inhabited planet because verse 10 says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones will bring my offering. And so you have all the way into, from Israel, another continent, all the way down into Africa. Verse 11, in that day, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove them from your midst, your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. I mean, this is the planet with its current geographical markers. In a day where the Messiah is reigning and the pride of man will not be tolerated, only Yahweh is getting glory on this day. All glory goes to him. Verse 12, I'll leave among you a humble, lowly people. They will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will the deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. I mean, this is the eradication of every opponent of God's own people. The king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, don't be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love, or better, he will quiet you in his love. He's going to be doing all the singing. We're, we're, our mouths are going to be closed, with overwhelmed. He will shout over us with shouts of joy. And I'm going to gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They're going to come from Zion. And he goes on to describe, and it's just at that time, in that day, this is what it's going to look like. It's global. It's divine dominion mediated through a human element. Let me give you another example. Uh, where, in, Look at Matt Micah, Micah chapter 4. Here's another example, and I'm going to give you about four passages so that you can have fresh in your mind what the, prof what the prophecies about the kingdom of God look like. And these are, none of these are the mystery. So, you know, if you read everything in the Old Testament about the kingdom, it's profound and glorious, and that's still not the mystery. And so I'm just going to give you a few, a few more examples here. Look at Micah chapter 4. Now, Micah's interesting. He goes ahead and uses the phrase, in the last days. So he's clearly talking about a future. And um, by the way, you can look at a parallel here in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. And um, in 4 verse 1, Micah writes this, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for the mighty and distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. I mean, this is the eradication of all hostilities to the point that no nation even needs a military because Christ is reigning. I mean, no more military anymore. That's obsolete. That was the previous age. All military equipment gets to be transformed into something that's going to be productive for the welfare of its citizens because Christ is reigning. Skip down to verse 6. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. For the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. As for you, Tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion. To you it will come. Even the former dominion will come. The kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. This is a kingdom and a dominion that's still future. 
and you can see the reverse of the curse. You can see the eradication of sickness and disease. You can see the establishment of economies that are prospering for the welfare of every citizen in those nations and the absolute uh, lack of need for military, police, or medicine. To the point that Isaiah can even say in this kingdom that somebody who died at the age of 100 is going to be said that they died in infancy. This is clearly not an age that we've experienced, and it's still future. Uh, You can read, as I mentioned, Isaiah 65. You can read Zechariah 14. Incredible statements about this future kingdom. Incredible prophecies. Zechariah 14 being so vivid of what's going to happen when Christ establishes global dominion. Everything's going to be consecrated to him, and he's going to rule over all the nations. And so now, when we go back to Mark chapter 4, Turn back to Mark chapter 4 to our particular parable. I want that in your mind because when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, remember that he he explains privately that this is the, the mystery of the kingdom. So he's not sitting there saying, hey, let me just make some parables about what the Old Testament said. He's saying this is the secret of the kingdom. This is something previously unrevealed about the kingdom. And so, you know, theologians have sometimes called this the um, the already not yet tension because Jesus comes along and starts describing things that don't quite fit with some of the Old Testament prophecies. Not that none of them are contradictory. None of them are distinct from or impossible to reconcile with. It's just that he says more about the kingdom. And so sometimes theologians like to say it's the already not yet tension. Um... And and a lot of that came from George Eldon Ladd when he wrote his book, The Presence of the Future and the Gospel of the Kingdom. And it kind of became uh, commonplace to think about a a passage like this and to say, okay, what Jesus is teaching us is he's teaching us what aspect of the kingdom has already arrived that we wouldn't have known. Well, let's go back and reread our Old Testament and we realize when it arrives, no one's asking the question, has it arrived? (laughs) What Jesus is saying here is he's like, but I am going to tell you something about the kingdom that hasn't been revealed yet, and this is new. What's new that you wouldn't have learned from the Old Testament because it's not there, is that after Christ has shown up and he's taught the gospel and called the nation to repent for three chapters, and he's rejected and rejected and rejected, and then he starts to speak in parables because truth is now being concealed. He knows his path. Forward is rejection by his own people whom he came to save. And he says, let me tell you a secret about the kingdom. It's not going to happen with a snap of the fingers. It's going to get built slowly over this next age as the word of God goes forth. And before that kingdom comes, my father is going to make kingdom citizens who will be ready for this future kingdom. You wouldn't have known that from the Old Testament because it's not there. It was a mystery. And that's what he's teaching us. So very important that we don't skip that phrase, the kingdom of God is like. And it's also important that we don't skip the phrase, the mystery of the kingdom of God in verse um, 11. And one more comment, verse 13. It's also important that we don't forget the explanation because in verse 13, he says, do you understand this parable speaking of the soils? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. Okay, remember, the sower sows the word. That's important for understanding everything else he says. So when we get to verse 26, we don't have to have a new key, a new code to understand the references of what he's referring to. The sower is still sowing the word. It's interesting, you know, after the parable of the soils, I mean, the sower really doesn't do anything except sow. And it's like four different responses based on the soils. It's like, well, the sower is the same in all four soils. The seed is the same in all four soils. And yet the response is different in those four soils. Three of them respond with unbelief. Some of them look like belief initially, but they all end up turning to be unbelief. And then the fourth one alone responds in faith and believes. You think, well, where's the, where's the parable about how to sow. I mean, that's, that parable was all about how you listen. Well, what about the parable about how you sow? Well, here it is. Here's your parable about how to sow. Verse 26, 
The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. That's all he needs to say. And so your first step is so. Number two, verses 27 and 28, sleep. Well, what do you do next? Well, he goes to bed at night and gets up by day. Literally, this guy happens to go to bed and get up night and day. And it's a Semitism, the night and day. Remember, uh, there was morning and there was evening. Uh, there was evening, then there was morning the first day. So um, night, then day is the, uh, the, the Hebrew way of thinking about a day. And so here he says, he goes to sleep and gets up. Night and day, night and day. We would say, you know, day and night, day and night. He just keeps going to bed and getting up, and that's, that's, that's what he does. He sleeps. He wakes up. He sleeps. He wakes up. It's pretty clear, right? The, our, our pretense of what we contribute to the kingdom is quickly unraveling. <laughs> Go to sleep. Meanwhile, he says this, and the seed sprouts and grows. While the farmer is sleeping and getting up and he goes back to bed and maybe he falls asleep and maybe he didn't sleep well so he sleeps a little longer and then he shaves and eats breakfast and does it all over again and he goes back to sleep. The seed is actually doing something. The blade, the blade of, of green breaks through the crust of the ground and then it starts to grow, literally, it, to make long. And so obviously with a plant, it's just, it's just growing up. So it starts with that tiny little uh, sprout, and then it starts to become a plant. And then he inserts this important, important statement in the parable. At the end of verse 27, this is so important. How? He himself does not know. Hmm. That's humbling. And for you uh, botanists, I don't even know if that's the right word, botanist, you say, well, we know a lot about germination. This exposes our pretense and our pride. It's interesting, you know, the farmer's completely ignorant of all that, how all this happens. And now, of course, he could study and he could look at the germination, the dying of the seed, and what particular seed he's planting, how much moisture is needed for the germination to happen. He can count the days and he can do it year after year and he can come up with a really good average and say, this particular seed, it's going to take X number of days or this range of days to germinate and then you'll see the blade at that particular point. And he might even do some scientific study and examine what, when, at what point the seed actually dies so that it can produce a different plant. And we might know all sorts of chemical and biological elements of what's happening when a seed turns into a plant. But every level of study and every question answered presses into another level of unanswered questions that we still don't have. Think about, um, in, the in the progress of science, think of uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his brilliance. He came up with uh, the law of universal gravitation. And so here's his formula. In case you forgot, um, I'll give it to you. I know this is common knowledge. I'm going to try to impress you. You like that? All the teachers are like unimpressed. But everybody else, this is so cool. <laughs> F equals G times mass 1 times mass 2 divided by D squared, where G is the gravitational constant and D is the distance between the centers of mass 1 and mass 2. Aren't you impressed? Now he has that, uh, okay, so a couple engineers gave me a thumbs up. Everybody else be impressed. Um, Einstein added to this theory, uh, this, this law, he added to this, the theory of relativity where he predicted that gravity is going to have an effect um, on light and it even distorts the space around it. So that's why uh, there's refraction of light and that's why, you know, is light, uh, is, it, is it matter or is it energy? Is it a, a mass or is it particle? And all those debates happen because we're trying to figure these things out. And so we, we're sitting here and, and we're studying gravity and we think, oh, okay, mass creates gravity, and we have a formula for even the strength of gravity based on the distances between the two objects, and that's why we, can, we, we are so smart that we know that oxygen is more dense at surface, at the, at the level of the, the sea level, as opposed to 80,000 feet above the surface of the earth. We're so smart, we figured it all out. And you press in the level of electrons and neutrons, and when, when parts of atoms are orbiting around other parts of atoms, and we, we are left without subatomic answers. And we find some answer to that, and it leads to another question where we just don't have answers. And we find in Hebrews 1.3 that the answer to the subatomic orbit of electrons around neutrons is, a nucleus is 
the sustaining power of the word of Christ. And so, regardless of how much we know about germination, when it comes right down to it, how does that actually happen? We don't know. It's God causing growth to happen from a seed. It happens automatically. Verse 28, that's exactly what he says. Jesus explains this way. He says, the soil produces crops by itself. The farmer may be ignorant, but the soil produces this crop. The seed goes into the soil, and it produces a blade and then a plant all by itself, automatically. This word um, automatically, literally automate, it's interesting because it only occurs twice in the New Testament. One of them is here. The other one is in Acts 12.10 when Peter is led out of the prison by the angel and it says the door opened automatically. So there's the automatic jail door opener and he just goes right out. It opens right in front of him. It's the only other time this word is used. Here it's talking about something happening on its own. It's self-actuating. And that's exactly what's true of the seed in the soil. Crops are automatic. First comes the blade, then the head, and then the mature grain in the head. So think of a head of wheat, and then the kernels inside the head of wheat. Or think of an ear of corn, and then the kernels inside the ear. And so whatever grain you happen to be discussing, it's all the same. There's just a little blade, it breaks to the ground, then you have it grow into a plant, and then full grain replicated starts to be produced in the head of that plant. And that's the end of uh, step two, sleep. What do you want to do? What do you need to do to build a self-building kingdom? Well, you got to go to sleep. I have a, one of my favorite examples of this in church history is what Martin Luther said. He said this in a sermon on March 10th, 1522. And in this sermon, he's preaching about some of the enemies of the gospel. And I'm going to read to you. It's two paragraphs. So you're going to you're gonna have to listen. But I know you're up for it. I'm, as I read this first line, he talks about people, the people who are weak. And that's people who are not believing the gospel um, yet. Listen to what he said. Love, therefore, demands that you have compassion on the weak, as all the apostles had. Once, when Paul came to Athens, a mighty city, he found in the temple many ancient altars, and he went from one to the other and looked up at them all, but he did not kick down a single one of them with his foot. And by the way, I should probably explain in 1522, you already have um, um, iconoclasm happening where uh, Protestants are repenting and they're just absolutely assaulting uh, cathedrals and... and, um, monasteries and they're just doing destructive vandalism to the property because they think that they're actually doing the work of the gospel by this form of vandalism. And so he's actually opposing that here. And that's why he's talking about not caught kicking down an idol in Athens with his foot. He continues, rather he, speaking of Paul, stood up in the middle of the marketplace and said they were nothing but idolatrous things and begged the people to forsake them. Yet he did not destroy one of them by force. When the word, listen, When the word took hold of their hearts, they forsook them of their own accord. And he, uh, I've lost it. When uh, they took hold of their hearts, they forsook them of their own accord. And in consequence, the thing fell in and of itself. Likewise, if I had seen them holding mass, I would have preached to them and admonished them. Had they heeded my admonition, I would have won them. If not, I would nevertheless not have torn them from it by the hair or employed any force, but simply allowed the word to act and have prayed for them. For the word created heaven and earth and all things. The word must do the thing and not we poor sinners. In short, I will preach it, teach it, write it, but I will constrain no man by force For faith must come freely without compulsion. Take myself as an example. I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Melanchthon and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. Had I desired to foment trouble, I could have brought great bloodshed upon Germany. Indeed, I could have started such a game that even the emperor would not have been safe. 
But what would that have been? Mere fool's play. I did nothing. I let the word do its work. What do you suppose is Satan's thought when someone tries to do the thing by kicking up a row? He sits back in hell and thinks, oh, what a fine game the poor fellows are up to now. But when we spread the word alone and let it do all the work, that distresses him, for it is almighty and takes captive the heart. And when the hearts are captured, the work will fall of itself. Spoken by someone who actually did have the human means at his disposal to stir up a revolution and to foment a riot. But he knew that would have been child's play and a waste of time. He decided to sow and then go to sleep. Number three, stand by. Verse 29. When the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Simply put, the harvest is the judgment that happens to inaugurate the kingdom. In Joel chapter 3, you'll find the phrase where Jesus is, is quoting from here. In Joel chapter 3, verse 13, the prophet writes, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And it goes on to describe the judgment of the Lord. And he's going to eradicate from his kingdom all of the enemies, and they will be removed, and he's going to reign over his people. And so what he's describing here is what, something you would not have expected from the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, you expect Messiah's going to show up, instant kingdom, eradication of all of his enemies. And the king shows up, and he says, nope, it's actually not right now. What's going to happen is I'm leaving, and I'm going to be preaching the word. I'm handing it on to my apostles. They're going to be preaching the word. It's going to do the work automatically. Sp sprouts are going to grow up. And as he even says in the parable of the wheats and the tares, the field is the world, and during the church age, you're going to have sons of God cohabitating on this planet with their spiritual enemies, hostile to the gospel. And don't bring the harvest too early, yes, you, lest you do damage to the wheat and the tares. But when Christ comes back a second time, there will be a harvest, and those who are not in the kingdom will be taken, and those who are in the kingdom will inhabit that kingdom to serve him in his earthly reign in the millennium. Think about this parable, friends, and think about the implication for our listening. Sometimes I listen to the word and can sometimes get nervous. Oh, man. How am I doing? Well, if you're listening rightly to the word, you're just impressed with what God's telling you and you're eager to take him on by faith and move forward in obedience and sometimes if we find ourselves weary of listening because we're turning our listening into uh, some sort of performance we need to consider that the word carries its own self-actuating power it's our job to listen to listen well to submit and to walk forward in faith it's his job to give us the power to do so Think about the application for speaking. Are you confident that the word is sufficient, or do you doubt this? A low view of God's word for accomplishing the uh, humanly impossible, well, that's going to produce a lot of problems. We've already mentioned some of those. But just be, re be refreshed by this parable. The word of God produces its own results. It bears its own fruit in and of itself. If we miss this truth, we'll be either anxious evangelists or proud evangelists. We'll be anxious parents or proud parents, and both are wrong. We'll take credit for conversion or growth or discipleship. We'll take credit for the fruit that must go to God and his word alone. The encouraging thing about this parable is it accentuates our confidence in the power of his word, and it exposes our absolute inability. So believers, let's get busy sowing sleeping and standing by. Father, thank you so much for this parable. It's just short and sweet and it's just so powerful because it bears testimony to the self-actuating power of your word. Your kingdom is a kingdom that builds itself. Your word is a, a seed that causes its own, its own growth and it does this automatically. To think that you would even call us to be part of 
sowing as parents and as friends, as co-workers, as neighbors. It's just overwhelming, Lord. And here we are, we're, if, if we're your children this morning, if we're your heirs, then we are members, we are current members of a future kingdom. And I pray, Lord, that we would never forget and never lose sight of the fact that your word uh, causes its own fruit and produces its own results, lest we get distracted by trying to produce a kingdom on our own, a, a man-made kingdom, a cheap, a cheap um, plastic, paper mache version of the kingdom that you alone will bring. And I pray that we would be singularly devoted to sowing and trusting your word to do the, do the, the work. Thank you so much for the power of your truth. In your name we pray, amen.